The ancient cistern, found behind Florius waterfall in Scarlet Sword, is one of the most beautiful and interesting temples in the Zelda series. Being the fourth dungeon of Scarlet Sword, it is a mysterious structure that serves as the home of Pharaoh's flame, one of the three flames of the golden goddesses necessary to temper the goddess sword into the legendary Master Sword. The temple contains many mysteries within its walls, such as the dark cavernous underlevels overflowing with undead monsters, to the large statue of an unknown individual that stands at the heart of the cistern, connecting the highest levels of the sanctuary to the dark depths below. Who is this mysterious individual? Why is he featured in this dungeon and nowhere else in the game? To find out the answer, we must first analyze the dungeon itself for clues. Looking at the ancient system's overall design, it is clear that the dungeon is heavily influenced and centered around various Buddhist themes. So much so, that to cover all the connections in this video, will make it way too long. And fellow Zelda content creator Nintendo Black Crisis already made an extensive video going over the many connections between the ancient cistern and Buddhism. And I highly recommend you watch it, as he explains these connections better than I ever could. A link to his video will be in the description below. Regardless, I'll go over the most important connections to Buddhism relevant to this theory. The ancient system's central themes that tie to Buddhism are those of purification and enlightenment, seen on the structures found within. The temple has abundant symbolism of lotus flowers, from wall designs depicting the flowers, wall lanterns, stained glass ceiling windows depicting the bloom lotus, the blessed idol that serves as the boss key and the boss door itself, on the whip, the main item of the dungeon, as well as literal lotus flowers growing inside the structure and outside of the dungeon entrance. In Buddhism, the lotus flower is a symbol of fortune. As it grows in muddy water, its environment gives the flower its meaning rising and blooming above the murk to achieve enlightenment. The core of the lotus flower also bears a meaning in Buddhism, such as purity, love, spirituality, or enlightenment. The stage in which the lotus flower is in also represents a different stage of enlightenment. A closed lotus flower represents a time before enlightenment, while a fully bloomed lotus flower represents full enlightenment. As the dungeon only showcases bloom pink lotus flowers, it's clear that it represents the history of Buddha and the historical legends of Buddha, as well as full enlightenment. In fact, the Buddha compares himself to a lotus, saying that the lotus flower rises from the muddy water unstained as he rises from this world free from the defilements. The pink lotus flower is considered to be one of the most celebrated flowers of all as it is considered sacred, as well as being associated with the highest realms of Buddhism, with the Buddha himself, many kings, and the highest deity often depicted with this plant. Emphasis on the last part, it depicts the highest deity. In the Buddhist pantheon, the Buddha was at the highest point in the divine hierarchy, above all other gods having reached the purest form of enlightenment. At the center of the ancient system, there is a large statue that closely resembles Buddha, revered as the founder of the world religion of Buddhism. Throughout the series, various gods from numerous religions have made their way into the series in one way or another, as the series takes inspiration from many religions from across the world. The Golden Goddesses, for instance, take direct inspiration from the three pure ones from Taoism. Much like Hyrule, Taoism has a creation story involving three gods, who each took part in the creation of the universe, and the parallels between the two are instantly seen when compared. First, we have Yuan Shi Tianzun, who oversaw the earliest phase of creation of the universe, creating the universe from the primordial chaos. He was represented by the color blue. This god will be equivalent to Din, who created the earth and added red. And while she is represented with the color red in most games, 
In the game that first introduced her, A Link to the Past, the pendant of power was blue instead of red. Then there's Link Bao Tianzun, who separated the yang from the ying, the clear from the murky, calculated time, dividing it into different epochs, gave the world the law of things, giving it order, and classified the elements into the rightful groups. He was represented by the color red. Clearly this is Nehru, who poured her wisdom into the earth and gave law to the world. Like Din, while Nehru is represented with the color blue in most games, in A Link to the Past, the pendant of wisdom was red instead of blue. And finally, we have Daore Tianzun, who brought civilization and preached the law to all living beings, and who was represented by the color yellow, sometimes depicted as green. This would be Pharaoh, who created all living things to uphold the law of Nehru. Another example is Hylia, who is predominantly based on goddess Amaterasu from Japanese mythology, believed to be the goddess that birthed the royal family of Japan, much like Hylia who birthed the royal family of Hyrule. It is never stated anywhere that the golden goddesses are the highest deities in the solar pantheon of gods. We merely know that they descended from the heavens to the chaos, created the world, and returned to their divine home leaving behind the Triforce. Of course, they are the most powerful gods that we know of, since they created the world and the Triforce itself, but for all we know, they may just be denizens of the world of the gods, ruled by a being of higher power than themselves. Even the mice, the demon king who battled against goddess Hylia, before the final confrontation against Link, as he tells him of his hatred for the gods, he refers to them as the gods' clan, and clans or tribes usually have a leader, chief, or king. It is my belief that this statue within the ancient cistern represents the highest deity in the pantheon of Hyrule's gods, a being far superior than the golden goddesses themselves, Hyrule's version of Buddha. I propose the idea that this higher god was the one who ordered the golden goddesses to descend to the chaos and create the world, perhaps even being the creator of the golden goddesses themselves. But we can actually go much further in regards to this god's origin, as I believe we have heard of this god in the past, but before we get there, we must first take a look at the ancient cistern's second theme, purification. In this ancient cistern, Purified water is released into the upper area of the facility, while the filtered impurities are processed in the lower area. As described by Phi, the ancient cistern is a facility constructed to purify water. But why would there be a need to purify water? I mean, they have Lake Flora just beside it with fresh water. Well, the answer lies in sacred water. Sacred water is a special kind of water found in the sacred springs. It is pure water that can heal wounds, and has mystical properties that cannot be found in ordinary water. While it may look like ordinary water, this absolute pure water contains a powerful energy. Zelda, in order to regain her memories as Hylia, had to bathe herself in the purifying waters of the sacred springs to purify her spirit and regain her lost memories. It is believed that this powerful energy in the sacred water capable of healing wounds is none other than force, a sacred power that resides in all living beings. Force is also the same energy that Impa describes to be the source of the Master Sword's power to repel evil. Impa describes force has the sacred power gifted to this world by the ancient gods, and says that it is spoken of in the Ballad of the Goddess. The Ballad of the Goddess says the following, Youth guided by the servant of the goddess, unite earth and sky and bring back the light. The light mentioned in the Ballad of the Goddess is the sacred power known as force. It wouldn't be the first time that force has been described as a divine light. 
in the Minish Cup. We learned that the Minish descended from the sky and handed the hero of men a blade that would come to be known as the Picori Sword and a golden light known as the Light Force. The Light Force in Japanese is merely called Force, the same being the case for Life Force describing Phantom Hourglass as well as the Force Gems. All are Force, and Force is Light. Even the trifles itself, left behind by the Golden Goddesses when they left their newly created world, is a form of this Force. I mean, it's literally in the name, Tri-Force. And in official artwork of A Link to the Past, the Tri-Force is referred to as the Master Force. It is the fundamental power of the universe, the pillar that sustains the world, and without it, the world would spiral into chaos. We directly see the consequences of depriving the world of the Triforce in A Link Between Worlds, where Low Rule, a parallel world to Hyrule, began to crumble and spiral into chaos after they destroyed their own version of the Triforce, their world having lost its light and being turned into a dark world. So, if the Triforce is made of Force, it means that Force is a fundamental power of the world, one which maintains order and gives life. When Link tempered the Goddess Sword in each of the three flames, the crest of the Triforce appeared on the back of his hand. This crest does not mean that he has the Triforce in that very moment, in fact, gets the physical trifles much later on in the story, but rather, it represents the sacred power of Force. Soda even states the following when we meet her in the past. That mark of light shining on the back of your hand proves that within you dwells sacred power. In Spirit Tracks, Hanjin explains that happiness and gratitude create energy, and gives Link and Zelda a Force Gem. Force Gems, crystallized forms of force, are created from feelings of gratitude. This is seen when certain NPCs generate Force Gems after helping them in certain side quests, as they generate these Force Gems from their immense gratitude and happiness. This is especially significant, as in Skarmut Sword, a similar material is created from the same motion, gratitude crystals, known in Japanese has feelings of gratitude, and these, like Force Gems, are given to Link after many side quests from thankful people. The description of the Gratitude Crystal reads, This form, when a person is so completely overwhelmed with feelings of thankfulness, that crystallized gratitude is created. Gratitude is also directly tied to the theme of purification. In the floating islands of Skyloft, there exists a friendly demon named Batro. Unlike the other demons of the surface, Batro wishes nothing more than to befriend the humans of the sky, and asks Link to gather gratitude crystals for him, as with a sufficient amount of them, he would be able to transform into a human. Gratitude crystals, or more specifically, force, can purify a demon to transform him into a human. Batro, despite being a friendly demon, expels a malevolent aura that spawns numerous monsters across Skyloft, and when he is turned into a human, these creatures cease to exist, his aura being purified by the Gratitude Crystals, and by extension, Skyloft is purified of the monsters. The evil aura is what we refer to as Malice, a substance created from pure hatred which is most prominent in Breath of the Wild, but it stems all the way back to Scoured Sword, seen in the form of evil crystals, described to be a solid chunk of pure crystallized monster malice. And while in Japanese the description doesn't mention malice, instead describing the object as a crystallized evil heart of a demon, we know from Breath of the Wild that demons are a manifestation of malice. These crystals are dropped from cursed enemies, such as the cursed keys and cursed bokoblins, both enemies being found in the hellish caverns of the ancient cistern. 
The descriptions of the cursed bokoblins reads as follows. This horrifying bokoblin reanimates after death. Analysis indicates it fears pure shiny items and will startle at the sight of a sacred shield. It is able to reanimate purely through its hatred of this world and its attachment to outlandish underpants. In Breath of the Wild, cursed bokoblins make a return as skulls imbued by malice, and their description reads as follows. The malice has given this bokoblin skulls a sort of life. Devoid of any intelligence the bokoblin it once belonged to may have had, these pitiful things only exist to attack anything that gets too close. Malice, pure form of hatred, reanimates the dead. It is created from negative energy, from feelings of hatred. False, on the other hand, is his antithesis, pure forms of happiness, which drives away malice, as seen with the Master Sword. It is created from positive energy, from feelings of gratitude. Feelings of gratitude don't just end here, as they are directly tied to the ancient cistern, most specifically the blessed idol, the bosky of this dungeon. Its description reads the following. This carved wooden statue looks like it's supposed to inspire gratitude. It also looks like the stone statue on the upper floor. And on the stone tablet in front of the central statue, this is said regarding one of the dungeon's puzzles. Carved into the great statue are inscriptions of gratitude. They reveal the secret order of this temple. There is an even more subtle reference to gratitude and happiness in the architecture itself of the ancient cistern, as it all has to do with the Ashtam Mangala, a sacred suit of eight auspicious signs endemic to a number of religions such as Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism. These eight auspicious signs are the following, the conch, the endless knot, a pair of golden fish, lotus, parasol, a vase, the Dharma Chakra, and the Victory Banner. While not all, some of these are very much integrated into the Daniel's overall design, and their influence are certainly of importance in uncovering the identity of the statue. We have already gone over the lotus, which as I've said before, one of its meanings is that of purifying the spirit. The pair of golden fish is the other symbol I want to point out. The depictions of fish resembling large carps are found prominently in and around the ancient cistern, as patterns engraved on the walls, as well as large statues protruding from the walls and the ground itself, and the entrance to the dungeon, with its tail raised high above its head. In Buddhism, the fish symbolize happiness as they have complete freedom of movement in the water. Remember, gratitude crystals and force gems form from extreme feelings of gratitude and happiness. Like mentioned before, the ancient cistern is a facility that purifies water, and this purification is depicted through divine symbology, which I also believe is a reflection of the eternal struggle between force and malice between good and evil, between the gods and the demons. This struggle between positive and negative energy is seen directly on the pillars found all across the ancient cistern. The middle represents the yin and yang design, a symbol depicting the duality of two opposing forces, one positive and the other negative. The top of the pillar resembles clouds often associated with the heavens, and the bottom may symbolize hell through the use of prison bars, as hell is oftentimes seen as a prison. The ancient system has two distinct levels, a higher level that is depicted as a heavenly paradise, and an underground level that resembles a hellish pit separated from its divine exterior by what looks to be prison bars. One part of these underground caverns is directly inspired by the story of the spider's thread. 
In this short story, Buddha strolled through the heavenly paradise when he looked down towards the pit of hell, when he caught the eye of Kandata, a condemned soul who didn't commit any act of kindness in his lifetime, except for sparing the life of a single spider. Moved by this single act of compassion, Buddha lowered a single spider thread so that Kandata could ascend to paradise. However, as other sinners began to climb the thread, Kandata selfishly proclaimed that the thread was his and his alone. And due to his lack of compassion, the spider's thread broke, forcing him and the other sinners to fall back to the dark depths below. This is clearly represented in the ancient sister, with Link climbing up a thin thread as cursed bokoblins climb after him. In fact, the top half of the ancient cistern is also filled with sculptulas as well as spiderwebs, and this thread that Link climbs may actually be a spider thread created by a sculptula. As you can see, this dungeon is a literal representation of heaven and hell, the top parts of the cistern symbolizing the divine, purity and force, while the under levels symbolize the demonic, impurity and malice. Even the dark caverns below have stone carvings closely resembling bokoblins, common demons of the world of Hyrule, and pools of reddish water which closely resembles the pools of malice seen in Breath of the Wild. As I mentioned previously, the golden goddesses are related to the three pure ones from Taoism. Nero in particular is tied to Ling Bao Tianzun, who separated the yang from the ying, and I believe that Nehru did the exact same thing. I believe that the fundamental complementary forces of the cosmos, force and malice, were interlocked in a chaotic struggle before creation, and when the golden goddesses descended into this chaos, Nero separated these opposing forces by creating order, creating two separate worlds, the light world a world reaching force where Hyrule is located, and the Dark World, known in the English version as the Dark Realm, which will make an appearance in Spirit Tracks, a world plagued with malice, also known as a demon world. Nero would, unknowingly, create a world concentrated with malice, and from this Dark World, the demons would spawn, one of which being Demise who would lead an invasion in the light world to try and claim the Triforce for his own. This separation of these two worlds would lead to the eternal conflict between the gods and the demons, and perhaps the eternal grudge of the demons may be a result of the gods neglecting the dark world and only focusing on the world of light. There is one particular conflict that I do want to point out between the gods and the demons, one that is described at the start of Spirit Tracks. It is in Spirit Tracks that we learn of a singular deity known simply as the God of Light, known in English as the Spirits of Good for some unknown reason. The God of Light is a powerful deity who battled against the demon King Maladus in the distant past, served by the Locomo a group of spiritual sages who reside in a land that would become New Hyrule. The God of Light, wielding the Bow of Light, managed to seal away Maladus deep underground, using the spirit tracks, magical rails that channel the mystical power of Force, emanating from Force gems located within the four temples on each corner of the land, binding them together with the Tower of the Spirits, which served as a lock to the Demon King's chains. The spirit tracks themselves also possess force gems on top of the space-time gates, special gateways that allow the user to walk from one another across the land. As we can see, this God of Light is directly tied to force, which we have also previously seen is represented as a golden light, and I strongly believe that this is the god depicted in the ancient cistern, represented as a golden statue. But we can take this a step further. From a link to the past onwards, we are told of the golden goddesses, 
a divine trinity of extremely powerful gods who descended upon the primordial chaos and created the world and everything in it. Din, the goddess of power, Nehru, the goddess of wisdom, and Pharaoh, the goddess of courage. These three golden goddesses are considered to be the most important deities of Hyrule, and not only did they create the world and everything in it, but also created a relic that housed the power, capable of bending reality and granting wishes to whomever possessed it, that would maintain the order of the world, the trifles, three golden triangles left in the care of goddess Hylia, a goddess of lesser rank than the golden three, who was also immensely powerful. Throughout the games, certain locations and lesser deities have been named after these divine goddesses. In the case of Hylia, we have the well-known Lake Hylia, or Mount Hylia, located in the Great Plateau. The race of pointed-eared humans chosen by the gods that would come to be known as Hylians are also named after this divine goddess. For the case of Din, the goddess of power, there are deities such as the fire dragon from Skawat Sword or one of the light spirits from Twilight Princess, both sharing the name Eldin, who reside in the volcanic region of the same name. For the case of Nehru, the goddess of wisdom, there are deities such as the thunder dragon of Skawat Sword or one of the light spirits from Twilight Princess, both sharing the name Laneru, who reside in the region of the same name as well. Although in Skawat Sword, the region is known as Laneru Desert, but which by the time of Twilight Princess has been known for many centuries as Gerudo Desert, with the new Laneru province being the region where Sora's domain, the home of the aquatic Sora, is located. And for the case of Pharaoh, the goddess of courage, there are deities such as the water dragon from Skawat Sword, or one of the light spirits from Twilight Princess, both sharing the name Pharaon who reside in the four-step region of the same name as well. However, there is a fourth large spirit in Twilight Princess that I have yet to mention, one that shares no relation to the Golden Goddesses or any known god that we know of. While each of the three previously mentioned deities are named after the Golden Goddesses, Eldin named after Din, Laneru named after Nehru, and Pharaon named after Pharaoh, the fourth light spirit is named Latuan, known in English as Ordona. Unlike locations such as Lake Hylia, this spirit is named after something or rather someone else, and I do believe this light spirit to be named after a god, a god named Tuan, as two of the other light spirits have the name of the golden goddesses with a prefix, El Din. La Nehru, the latter being identical in structure as a La Tuan. The only exception here being Pharaon, although the name still derives from Pharaoh. What I propose is that Tuan is the name of the God of Light, the very same God we learn of in Spirit Tracks, and the same figure the ancient cistern is devoted to, who would be the leader of the God's clan. This could also mean that Latuan, the spirit of light, is the leader of the other light spirits, as he may be a sort of avatar for the leader of the golden goddesses themselves, who are also represented by the other three light spirits. The connections between the god of light and the spirits of light are quite interesting once you look further into them. First, and most obvious, the spirits of light and the god of light both share the same element of light. The God of Light wielded the Bow of Light during the battle against Maladus, later used by Zelda to aid Link during the final confrontation against the Demon King. And in Twilight Princess, the Spirits of Light give Zelda the Bow of Light to help Link battle against the Demon King Ganondorf. The Bow of Light contains immense power and can shoot arrows made of divine light. I believe this bow and the arrows it shoots to be made of force. In fact, in Twilight Princess, the light of the light arrows 
is described to possess the same power of repelling demons as the Master Sword, the Master Sword being called the Demon Repelling Sword, and the Light Arrows being described as the Demon Repelling Light. As we have said before, the Master Sword's power to repel demons is Force. This same power is found within the Light Arrows, both holding the power to banish evil. And I don't just think that it's the bow of light from Twilight Princess and Spirit Tracks that hold the power of Force. I believe each and every bow of light seen in the series uses the power of Force, such as the one in A Link Between Worlds, given to us by Princess Zelda, said to be bathed in the light of the Triforce. And as I've gone over before, the Triforce is a form of Force. We should also talk about Princess Zelda, who is directly tied to Force as well. We learn in Minish Cap that the golden light handed to the hero of men by the Minish, the Force, was placed within the princesses of Hyrule and passed down generation after generation. This sacred power has been referenced time and time again throughout the series, as a divine power held by the princesses of Hyrule. In Phantom Aglas, Belon, a voracious demon that consumes force, was drawn to the islands of the world of the Ocean King to fulfill its hunger by eating the force, and created rumors of a treasure inside the ship as bait for people to be captured by the ghost ship. And sensing Tetra's strong power, Bellum was drawn to her. In Spirit Tracks, Anjin tells Zelda that she has a sacred power that has been inherited by the royal family for generations. In Ocarina of Time, the composer brothers were tasked with studying the mystical power passed down by the royal family. This same power is later seen at the end of Ocarina of Time, where Zelda holds down Ganon with a sacred golden light. And in Breath of the Wild, the so-called sealing power is a power passed down from generation after generation, represented by the crest of the Triforce, which appears on the back of Zelda's hand whenever she uses its divine power, always depicted as a golden light. In fact, Zelda even summons the Bow of Light in Breath of the Wild during the Dark Beast Ganon fight to aid the hero which I believe, like all other bows of light, to hold the power of force. The Locomo Sword, a sword very similar to the Master Sword both in appearance and use, was once wielded by the God of Light, called the Heavenly One by the Locomos, to battle against demons. Normally, in the Tower of the Spirits, Link needed to obtain three tiers of light to imbue his regular sword with sacred power in order to take control of the otherwise invincible phantoms. However, with the Locomo Sword, Link no longer needed to obtain the tears, as the blade already possessed this sacred power. The power of the Tears of Light is most likely Force once again. We even see a Force Gem on the handle of the Locomo Sword, and as mentioned previously, the Master Sword's power to repel evil is also Force. Furthermore, the Four Sword, another mystical blade that holds the power to repel evil, is directly powered by Force Gems, with Force's adventures having the Four Links gather Force Gems to power the Four Sword. And to take things even further, the Phantom Sword, a blade forged in Phantom Hourglass, has Force directly imbued into it, as the sand of hours within the Phantom Hourglass, used to make its handle is pulverized force gems. All these blades have one thing in common. They are all powered by force, a divine power that drives back demons. The springs of the light spirits from Twilight Princess contain sacred water, which heal Link whenever he's in it. As we discussed before, sacred water has a sacred energy in it, the power of force the sacred energy found in all living things. In fact, all four spirits of light hold an orb of golden light, which likely is a pure manifestation of force, and perhaps they themselves 
may also be beings made entirely of force. The stolen light of the spirits of light from Twilight Princess also manifest as steels of light, the fragmented power of the light spirits. I believe that this, that the tears of light in spirit tracks, are also a manifestation of force. In Skyward Sword, similar tears are also found within the Silent Realms, which may also be a manifestation of force. The tears of Pharaoh, the tears of Nehru, the tears of Din, and the sacred tears. With all these links to force, the connections between the ancient Sistine statue, the God of Light, and the Light Spirits are clear in my eyes. What did you think of this theory? Do you agree with it? Let me know in the comments below. As mentioned at the start of the video, there are many more connections to Buddhism that I haven't gone over in this video, which Nintendo Black Crisis went over on his own channel. A link to his video will be in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to get notified of future uploads. Also, consider following me on Twitter and Instagram if you haven't already to stay in touch. This has been Sololo, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.